Cyberwork listeners, I have important news before we dive into today's episode. I want to make sure you all know that we have a lot more than weekly interviews about cybersecurity careers to offer you. You can actually learn cybersecurity for free on our InfoSec Skills platform. If you go to infosecinstitute.com slash free and create an account, you can start learning right now. We have 10 free cybersecurity foundation courses from podcast guest Keytron Evans, six cybersecurity leadership courses from also podcast guest Cicero Chimbanda, 11 courses on digital forensics, 11 courses on incident response, seven courses on security architecture, plus courses on DevSecOps, Python for cybersecurity, JavaScript security, ICS and SCADA security fundamentals, and more. Just go to infosecinstitute.com slash free and start learning today. Got it? Then let's begin today's episode. Today on Cyberwork, we're talking privacy. We're talking implementation privacy. We're talking policy privacy. We're talking all things privacy with privacy expert and InfoSec skills author and instructor, Chris Stevens. From his years in the government's Office of National Intelligence to his multiple IAPP certifications, Chris is more than happy to tell you everything you ever wanted to know about careers in privacy, around privacy, and careers that would be better with a heaping helping of privacy skills on top. Get into your cone of silence and join us today on Cyberwork. Welcome to this week's episode of the Cyberwork with InfoSec podcast. Each week, we talk with a different industry thought leader about cybersecurity trends, the way those trends affect the work of InfoSec professionals, and offer tips for breaking in or moving up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. Chris Stevens has spent over 35 years as a data protection professional, an information privacy professional, a strategic intelligence manager, and as a senior national intelligence service senior executive. Chris possesses all seven of the International Association of Privacy Professionals certifications. That's IAPP. Uh, he is an IAPP Fellow of Information uh, Privacy. Chris is an ISACA Certified Information Security Manager, Certified in Risk and Information Security Controls, and a Certified Data Privacy Solutions Engineer Professional. Uh, he has assisted numerous organizations in better managing their privacy and risk management programs. So if you are watching our info set career profile video series, you'll notice that I recently spoke with Chris uh, about um, the role of information risk analyst. And since we had such a great chat, I couldn't wait to get him back on the show. So uh, one of the things uh, we should mention is that Chris is also uh, does our InfoSec skills learning path on information privacy essentials. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about his cybersecurity journey and his abiding and massive interest in the concept of privacy as it relates to cybersecurity and maybe more. So Chris, thanks for joining me today. Welcome to CyberWork. Hey, thank you. First of all, I've got to get my virtual fire extinguisher out and spray myself. Spontaneous <laughs> combustion because I enjoy talking to you about these topics that are near and dear to my heart. Fabulous. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll keep the ice bucket challenge uh, That's right. near, near at hand. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic, just in case. Uh, so yeah, I always like to, I mean, especially here, I mean, I, I always like to find out about, uh, you know, your superhero origin story. So where did you first get interested in computers and tech and get excited about cybersecurity as a calling? What was the initial draw? It was in the military. It was part of my job. Okay. You know, I was a signals intelligence analyst or collector. Mm -hmm. And so I had to understand how to exploit. First of all, I had to understand the technology, yep. which evolved into computing information systems, communication systems. And then I had to develop or use tools to exploit it to get access to data. Mm -hmm. And so that carried on after I retired from the military, I worked another 13 and a half years in the government, you know, along the same lines. And then I decided I was tired. I was going to take a deferred retirement from the government, my second retirement, and I fell in love with privacy. Hmm. Or really, you know, how do we protect data? Yes. A lot of that data is housed either on endpoint devices and networks and systems. And so, you know, it helped me to, you know, acquire academically, you know, skills, but also certification that enabled me to help organizations better understand the risk associated with you know, processing data from the time you collect it until the time you get rid of. Hmm. Uh, so you just mentioned that you spent almost two decades working with the Department of Defense. So without breaking any rules or clearances or anything, can you talk about some of the cybersecurity related work you did while there? It looks like a lot of it was centered around risk assessment, which I'm guessing is what led to your full time move toward privacy, right? 
Uh, Well, if you talk about those two decades, a lot of it was uh, technology exploitation. Okay. You know, really, you know, working with uh, a number of intelligence agencies, uh, supporting the military. I was in a special mission unit. In the Department of Education, I mean, Department of Education, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that uh, that had you were a green unique, gray in the Department and, of Education, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it had anyway, a unique, yeah. it had a unique mission, mm-hmm. a global mission, strategic okay. intelligence mission on how do we answer questions that decision makers might have, civilian and military, mm-hmm. and we targeted, used very advanced tools to target these systems, foreign systems, people like mm-hmm. to say, oh, you're targeting U.S. systems. No, foreign systems themselves get access to that data right. and then bring that data back so we could, you know, satisfy, you know, national and uh, foreign objectives for the United States government. Okay. And very interesting. So, uh, you know, I, I, we talked a little bit about your, your, your educational background and I like to start my research on guests by going through their LinkedIn pages. Cause it always, uh, tells a story, uh, your deep study in computer sciences, uh, obviously is not too hard to see your, uh, I know that you're enrolled in a doctorate of it program with concentration in cybersecurity and information assurance. Uh, and also uh, it's rare that I get to see the topic of someone's doctoral dissertation, but the title is right there on the page. So I have to ask, can you, Tell me more about your dissertation titled Effects of Data Breaches on Sector-Wide Systemic Systematic Risk in Financial, Technological, Healthcare, and Service Sectors. Well, you know, again, you know, I referenced in our last discussion, mm-hmm. um, we talked about those vulnerable industries. Yeah. Financial industry, healthcare, and others. And, you know, I referenced a report that comes out every year, um, the uh, Ponymon IBM Institutes the Cost of a Global Data Breach. Yes, yes. And so, you know, one of the things, you know, I want to look at is, of course, we all know some of the contributing factors that you'd have as a result of a data breach, or even a security incident. But what are those long-term impacts that we are seeing on organizations, their profitability, their survivability? And then what are some of those things or actions they can take to forestall those before they threaten that profitability and, and survivability? Hmm. Okay, so uh, whereas the opponent's sort of weighing the financial uh, consequences, you're you're sort of you're sort of weighing the risk risk issues. Is that yes, exactly yeah, right? The, the okay. risk, uh, you know, again, if you look at it from a standard. In a risk formula, what are those threats, vulnerabilities? How do they, you know, translate into exploits? Mm-hmm. And then how does that place an organization at risk? Mm-hmm. How does the management itself, given those inherent risks, make the right decisions mm-hmm. to accept or avoid to transfer, uh, you know, risk? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, at the end of the day, what will happen is the results of a dissertation like this should come up with a model. Yes, that organizations right. can, you know, whether you're a system owner or, you know, a business owner, you can apply this risk calculus looking at your own as customized uh, to the organization itself and the industry to be able to understand your risk associated. And then those actions you can take um, to deal with threats like we've seen, like ransomware attacks and other attacks, because we're losing this battle to use military jargon. Mm hmm. You know, we're not winning the war, you know, right. we're losing right. this. Yes. And so we need to give business owners, you know, better tools to be able to, you know, to win the war. Right. So uh, from a research perspective, what are, what are what is the material that you're looking at to to sort of formulate this dissertation in this model? Like what, uh, you well, know, are you working on previous research? Are you conducting your own research or, or what, what well, you, you have to this? do? Well, you, you already you always start with you have to define what is the business question, mm-hmm. what is the, the business, the, the research issue, the research question. And once you've defined that, then you have to go out and do a lit review. So you look at literature on that topic because you don't want to just, you know, regurgitate, you know, old dissertations. If, some, if they've written on this extensively, then you probably need a new topic. Right. Yes, so you yes. go back and look at other dissertations. You look at peer reviewed journal articles yep. to get a sense of what's been written. And then yeah. what are those gaps? 
Yeah, make sure you're actually contributing something new in the world. That's exactly. Not not mm -hmm. just stealing someone else's ideas. You yep. know, some might call that plagiarism. Yeah. And then just, you know, changing the title, but it reads the same as the previous dissertation. You know, just doing it to get it done and get your... That's exactly your right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's exactly right. Okay. And so, and, and so it's just using a scientific model mm -hmm. or method really to, you know, walk this research methodology to where I can get to where I can make findings and recommendations based on my observations. Did you did you find some similar uh, research models dissertations in the field? Uh, oh yeah, that, there, that, that that made you sort of have to pivot your 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 focus. Yeah, they a little are. Bit? You know, mm -hmm. they're, they're out there. You you have to understand this is the sixty four thousand dollar question. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, <laughs> how do I prevent it. them? And if I'm if I experience a security incident of a data breach of such magnitude, how do I survive? Yes. Makes so sense. you know, again, you know, I've looked at tailoring it. Uh, looking at the healthcare industry, mm -hmm. you know, because the Pony Money Institute looks at all of these industries, right. does a really great job looking at, you know, I think the last report looked at over 400 countries, I mean, companies around the globe. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, that's that's a that's a very good start. Uh, and I, I just like to hear about higher ed. It's always interesting to me. So, uh, so well, you yeah. have you have you have a, a interest in it now, if not yeah, so yeah. before then you do now. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So yeah, to that end, I you know when we when I had you on for the the career profile to discuss information risk analyst and its role in cybersecurity, you immediately countered that privacy was your passion and that if I if I wanted to, you could speak for hours and hours about information privacy. So of course. Uh, that definitely sparked my interest, and I wanted to know more immediately. So, uh, to start with, and and to kind of root this discussion in your your infosec skills learning path and circle at boot camps, can you tell me about the concept of information privacy and also the International Association of Privacy Professionals certifications on this topic? Yeah, I sure can. You know, first I'll I'll, I'll start with my journey. It was okay. much like you alluded to earlier in our conversation. You know, I was sitting in my office. I've been a senior executive in government for. Uh, 13 years. I didn't see myself doing it for another 13 years. Yeah. A thankless task. Felt like Ben Hur ruined that ship. <laughs> and so, you know, I, 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 I was, you know, searching on the internet and I stumbled upon the IPP website. Hmm. And I was intrigued by this concept that we were going to create this cadre of privacy officers, data protection officers, help organizations show due diligence and due care every time they collect it, use, disclose, retain, dispose of personal information. And then I was hooked. And so I, you know, I, I left a job where I was earning over $150,000. I went from zero to 60 in the other direction. Wow. You know, got yeah. my first cert. And then, you know, I was still waiting to start my privacy journey while I was driving for Lyft, driving for Uber. Don't ever do that. No. And then working <laughs> as a private detective. Don't ever do that. That's even worse. Wow. Than, yeah. All and right. Then, I, I've just booked my next two episodes <laughs> with you here. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe those will be like Patreon exclusives or something. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> and then on, I got sorry. the call from IPP. They asked me to start teaching for it. You know, my first certification mm -hmm. was the U.S. privacy course. I teach that extensively now. Yes. Matter of fact, I teach, uh, I'll be teaching at the Global Privacy Summit in D.C. for IPP. Mm-hmm. And I acquired over time because I was hooked. You know, what I wanted to be was I wanted to be an operational privacy guy. Mm -hmm. now, I didn't want to just sit down and just, you know, beat people above, above the head and shoulders arguing about the definition of PII. Yeah, I wanted to right. be able to help them understand how to action privacy to make organizations more fix, uh, effective and efficient. And so I had to acquire the other six certifications. One has is, is been... Uh, put on the shelf because of uh, interest. That was the government course, which I really loved. Hmm. But I you know, acquired all four of the policy certs and then the certified information privacy manager, technologist um, certifications. And then that just, everything took off for me, Chris. Hmm. I mean, hmm. it was like my favorite poem in the world, the road not taken. I took yes. that road not taken. And it's given me a third career in privacy. And, and it's all I want to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm consulting now for an international law firm where I'm, it's privacy, cyber and privacy risk analysts. Yes. OK. And every day, those skills that I required from not only on the privacy side, you ask me about IPP, you still have to bring me back to InfoSec. Sure. Yes. Because yeah, it's InfoSec that helped balance me from the privacy and information security and risk management. 
Okay. So now I'm that operational privacy guy. Yeah. So, um, you know, when we, I, you know, I've done however many of these episodes and I feel like we have a good sense of like what the, you know, like what a CISO does, what a, mm-hmm. you know, what a CISSP encompasses. It's the security, but it's also the physical security and it's also, you know, fire and recovery and all these kind of things. But can you sort of put a big umbrella around what privacy in this context, what, what, what does privacy cover? Obviously privacy data, but what, what are, what are all the sort of facets of privacy that you're going to get into when you learn about just for a starting point, us privacy? Well, if you, if you do it right, you know, that privacy person is going to be sitting at the table or supporting those positions that you talked about the CISO, you know, they'll be supporting the CIO. They'll be working with that CISS peer. Mm-hmm. That CISA, because again, it's all about protecting those networks and systems, those activities that deal with processing personally identified information. So you can find, you know, I've worked as a privacy professional. I worked for the House of Representatives. Mm-hmm. It was like working for Google. Yeah. You know, it, for the Office of Cybersecurity. And so I was required to understand risk management from a privacy standpoint, privacy engineering. Systems engineering, privacy people do that. We just don't argue about definitions of PII. You yeah. can find yourself working in compliance, you know, governance, risk, and conformance, GRC. You can find yourself working for an organization like Amazon that was recruiting privacy people to really help them with Alexa and Echo because Alexa and Echo I hear a lot of stuff. What are the privacy yeah. controls in place? Right. You know, um, it's eclectic what I do now. Um, you know, I, I do risk, I do information security, I write policies, procedures, guidelines, and standards. I review contracts, mm-hmm. and I'm not an attorney. Right. I don't do it from the standpoint of giving legal advice. I'm asked to yes. look at it from my practitioner's standpoint. And because of all these acquired skills, these organizations trust me to do that. And then I hand it over to the attorney for the legal review. Got so, it. you know, the, the, the road is wide open for the privacy professional. The first thing starts with, Chris, is you have to get the certifications. Yes. Whether it's privacy or information security or risk management, because, you know, I'll give you an analogy. There are a lot of shade tree mechanics, you know, so they profess to be good mechanics. But are you going to take your car to them if they, if they don't have the certifications? Yes. Are you going to trust them with your livelihood, your safety? Right. It's the same thing with these companies. Yeah. They want yeah, yeah. to see certifications. Yep. And Chris, I have a lot of academic credentials. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've been in school forever. I'm 57. I have more yeah. degrees than anyone else has. No one's ever asked me about my degrees. Mm-hmm. They don't care. Right. <laughs> they yeah. care about the experience, the certifications, yep. and the experience yes. and knowledge and abilities. Yeah. So yeah. my, you know, I'm sorry, Chris. Go ahead. Oh, no, please. I was going to say Mike Myers was on on last week uh, to talk about uh, certifications, and he was saying, you know, with regards to uh, do you need uh, do you need a formal education or not? He said, yeah, get a bachelor's. He's like, we want to know that you can get a degree mm-hmm. and that you can follow it through. But beyond that, it doesn't matter. You get it, get it in, you know, uh, get it in sociology, get it in child psychology, whatever you want. But but we, you know, the, the the primary you know view, at least from a hiring perspective, is just that we know that you can carry out a degree program it's not the thing that we're actually looking for in terms of experience it's like the first job i got out of the military you know i was hired by the transportation security administration to be a a risk management specialist Mm -hmm. and so when i went in for the interview great guy um one of the best bosses ever you know he pulled out my resume my cv and he says man you've been in school for a long time (laughs) you've got a lot of degrees i said yes sir he says but i'm not hiring you for your degrees can you do the job? Walk me through why I should hire you to do the job. Yep. So we stopped talking about degrees. Mm-hmm. We started talking about skills, knowledge, and ability. And I got the job. Yeah. It was a fantastic opportunity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. I love that. So I, my, I was going to ask you what your thoughts on certification and search study were, but I, so we, we pretty much got that. But um, uh, can, can you talk about where you see certs like those offered by IAPP as fitting into the modern cybersecurity landscape? Like even if you're not in like a privacy space, is this something that you think other cybersecurity people would benefit from uh, studying towards, if not passing? They must. They must. Okay. This is me like Moses with the with the tablet with the Ten Commandments on it. You must. We can't have siloed approaches 
to protect these organizations. Yes. Okay. That's the reason why we need that, you know, CISSP and others to acquire these IPP certifications because it helps you better understand how to incorporate privacy into your day-to-day uh, roles and responsibilities. Right. You know, like I said, you know, it, not so much understanding every law, but what do those laws say about security? You know, administrative, physical, and technical safeguards, you know, responding to data breaches, because they do. And so if you understand the privacy applications, it makes you better at your job. Why do you think I am? I went in reverse. Okay. So I did all the privacy certs, and then I was unfulfilled. Because I couldn't achieve my goal without, you know, the C risk, the CSIM, yep. and the CDPSE, and also the IPP CIPT is Certified Information Privacy Technologies. Mm-hmm. You no, know, there was an article, Chris, that came out uh, mid last year that said that organizations are scrambling to hire privacy technologies. It's imagine. a lot easier to take a CISSP or sprinkle him with privacy and have <laughs> right. him or systems engineer and have them perform those functions and someone that is non-technical yep. and then has to acquire those over time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Interesting. So it's, it's, it, do you think that's, so that's, that's proper. You think it, it makes more sense to start with the security base and add the privacy, like you said, as a seasoning rather than start in the privacy space and then try to sort of like very quickly upskill yourself into the technical I think side. It beca- I think it begins on the person. You okay. know, for me, because of uh, some additional skills I received in the military, mm-hmm. you know, that that postured me to be able to go either way. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Uh, so uh, you mentioned it briefly before, but your resume indicates that you instruct students on U.S. privacy, sector pi- privacy, Asian privacy, Canadian privacy, European data protection, U.S. government privacy, privacy program management, and privacy and technology. Uh, so can you talk about some of the uh, the fundamental differences in privacy for those different countries, continents? Like, What is, what is the uh, difference in approach in terms of teaching? What are you, uh, is, it, is it kind of like if you learned Spanish, then you you have a leg up in learning Portuguese because they're similar language, you know, or is it, are they completely different in terms of- I can of- tell you, I did that and it's not as easy as you think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, you know, the army yeah, taught, yeah. it trained me in Spanish and Portuguese. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, depending on where you are, you speak Portuguese, the language can be different. Same as with Spanish. Sure, sure. And so, you know, if, if you're talking about jurisdictional laws, you have to have an understanding of the basics. Mm-hmm. You know, and and if you look at the U.S. laws, you know, they're complex, they're divergent. We're seeing that now a lot of the laws that like the European General Data Protection Regulation are now being brought to U.S. shores. Although Mm -hmm. we don't have a national law, the states are marching ahead. If you can look at, you know, some of these privacy trackers, it looks at, you know, we could have five to 10 states by the end of this year to have their own versions of the GDPR. Yeah. And and so you have to understand the basics of the law and then their applicability to your business model. Yep. Because you're not going to be successful as a privacy professional if you don't understand the organizational goals and objectives, the business model. And then be able to translate that to senior leadership to know when they have to make those hard decisions. You know, how do I comply with all these requirements? You know, how do we could build compliance plans like I'm building now to comply with these new global laws for the organization I'm supporting? And then once you understand those. And so for you, you ask a great question. You know, I want to be the end all be all when it comes to privacy. I want to kill the competition and I want them to know that I'm the best privacy uh, officer that you're going to hire. And the only way to do that is be fluent. Like you said, you talked about Spanish and Portuguese. Mm -hmm. I have to be fluent in Canadian privacy law, European privacy law, Japan, the Middle East. Yeah. That's what makes me competitive. Yes. That makes what makes me good at my job. And then you cross over the divide and get some of those privacy technology certs. ISACA Mm -hmm. has a great one. Just yep. started it uh, a year ago. I think it was put on hold because of COVID. The CDPSC. Oh, yeah. They've done mm-hmm. a great job with the CDPSC. And also IPP has gone back and revamped its CIPT because that goes back to an earlier question. We have to get people across the divide 
to where we have a common discussion on what privacy information and technology information security means procurement acquisition to an organization. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, can you sort of tease out the difference between the sort of privacy certs as done by uh, IAPP versus these more technical privacy certs as done like the like the CDPSE or the, you know, um, what 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 is the difference in learning? And is there if you're doing the tech side of it, does that require certain pre-existing knowledge within a sort of a, a computer science framework of things? No, it doesn't. It's just like okay. me, Chris. You know, when I started my privacy journey, I knew two things and I was an executive in the government. Mm hmm. This thing that they call PII must be important because it made me stop working to take a day to do training in it. And I had to know something about this Privacy Act of 1974. Okay. That was it. That was it. And so I started my privacy journey. I, I wasn't steeped in privacy. I bought a book. Mm -hmm. I read a book. I studied and I took an exam and lo and behold, I passed it. Mm -hmm. And then once I pass it, then I acquired that knowledge and those abilities and skills. And so, you know, when, when you when you look at privacy and, and you look at how we're going to approach and how we develop these, you know, whether you're an old guy, old girl, young guy, young girl, just trying to be gender, gender neutral here. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it just starts with having an understanding of if you do the IPP route, Chris. It's going to start really with policy. That's where you're going to be Got it. well steeped in the laws yep. and the different aspects. Um, they teach you how to manage a program. They teach you, you know, some they touch upon technology. But if you go the technology route, you know, ISACA is a great um, organization. And so it started with, you know, had COVID-5, COVID-19, you name it, uh, CMMI. And now they've taken that and added privacy to it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if you want to learn privacy in, in, in detail, you go to IPP and start that, that route. If you are a, an information technology security person, then, and you're an ISACA certified person or an IC squared, mm -hmm. then you pursue the uh, CDPSE because it is truly that onto it. technically yeah. focused. Yeah, that's the reason why I have it. Got it. Okay, so for uh, listeners uh, who uh, currently subscribe to InfoSec Skills or might decide to subscribe based on today's episode, uh, you can check it out for free at infosecinstitute.com slash free. Get a few, get a little taste of it. Uh, what will they learn from your information privacy essentials for cybersecurity professionals learning path? Like what aspects of security should they already be familiar with or working toward to start working on your learning path? Or is there no technical barrier to entry and they can just like jump right in today? I'm I'm getting my virtual fire extinguisher because <laughs> spontaneous <we> <laughs> combustion starting. You know, I you know, InfoSec reached out to me. I taught for it for several years mm -hmm. and they wanted their own course. And they wanted a comprehensive course that really helped cybersecurity, information technology, any other pro professional interested of having a grounded understanding in privacy. It's a long learning path. I, I didn't expect it to be that long. Hmm. I think it's like 20 or so CPEs. I think it's 29 hours. Wow. Yeah. Uh, it has like 12 modules and it starts with a foundational discussion on privacy because, you know, you can't build a house without a foundation that's going to collapse. So Absolutely. it starts with that foundation and it looks at privacy from just an, a evolutionary perspective. How do we define privacy around the globe? We start looking at some of those global laws. I'm going to update it because, you know, I'm excited about, you know, teaching about China's law and some new laws have evolved. Mm -hmm. And then we come back and we start looking at the U.S. And we look at it from the federal government's perspective. If you're working in government, then these are some of the things that you should know as a privacy professional. Then it translates into, you know, looking at the private sector, what you should know about some of these laws. Um, and then it ends with a discussion on the states. You know, if you're here in the United States, these new evolving laws, the Virginia um, Consumer Data Protection Act, the Colorado Protection Act, of course, California's all important privacy rights act. Yes. And then by the end of it, and one of the things I, you know, I talked about to the InfoSec Institute was we can only use um, open source resources. 
Mm, mm -hmm. because I didn't want to touch or have any copyright infringements with, you know, IPP because I teach for it. Right. And so I taught it. I separated myself from my IPP teaching experience and created really the course from scratch. If Mm -hmm. you take and complete this learning path, you're going to have a great understanding of privacy. And then depending on where you work, you can apply that. So I, I think it's a great learning path. It took me a year. You know, I had COVID, bad case of COVID, so it derailed the uh, development. But I think that everyone's happy with it. Yeah. Oh, no question. Um, so, Chris, what what types of positions? I mean, we talked about this a little bit, but but you said it, it'll set you up for for different sorts of positions. What type of positions require knowledge of information privacy? And can you talk about some of the practical applications of it, and maybe sort of map it to some of the job roles? Out there. I mean, I, I know you said basically anything, you know, would be better by knowing privacy, but obviously it's more important well, to someone than, you know, maybe, mm-hmm. maybe a pen tester is not using it a lot. But like, what are some of what are some of the, the sort of uh, the, the career spheres where where privacy is, is well, a must? If we're going to talk about it from, of course, if you're working as a privacy analyst yes. and you support an organization from privacy policies, compliance uh, the legal aspects, of course, that's always going to be one of the um, roles that you can have in privacy. But if you're talking about information security, you know, when we talk about things like the NIST uh, cybersecurity framework, if we're talking about, you know, ISO, ISC 27701, uh, because ISO is pretty smart. You know, we've talked about, you know, ISO 27001 forever. Then they mm-hmm. realize we have these systems out there that process private data personal data. So they, you know, in 2019, they, you know, shared it's uh, 27701 that's focused on privacy information management uh, systems. And so if you are an ISO, Mm -hmm. you know, and you're sitting there having discussion, you know, I used, when I was at the house, I sat in on the quarterly meetings where we sat with business owners, systems owners. And at some point in time, we would have that discussion about privacy. You know, if you have to do risk assessments, privacy risk assessments in support of, you know, FISMA requirements, you know, there's a privacy aspect there. You should understand it. You know, if you're an authorization official and you have to comply with NIST special publication 853 revision Mm -hmm. five. You know, I did a comparative analysis between Rev 4, Rev 5, you know, and Rev 5 is truly integrated privacy. So if you're going to be implementing the risk management framework. You better know privacy. If you're an authorization official, procurement. If you're a contracting official and you're and you're, you know, responsible for these contracts, whether initial contracts, you know, if you're talking about the uh, recompetes and these contracts deal with process and personal information, you should understand the aspects. What contract clauses should be there? I'll tell you another thing. Um, if you're engaged now, if you're in the private sector. And you're having to comply with uh, these laws like the EU GDPR. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about data transfer. It's been turned on its head. I mean, you know, right now, I'll give you an example. You know, they're banning Google, Google Analytics. Mm -hmm. Say that it's in violation of the GDPR, talking about anonymizing data. Who's going to do that? It's going to be some information technology person, security person that comes up with that solution, but they have to understand privacy first and the law becomes, they can come up with a solution. So, you know, you were right. My nebulous, you know, comment about anyone, Mm -hmm. you'll find yourself, if you're in those roles, you should have a basic understanding of privacy because it's touching your organization and Mm -hmm. you every day, you just don't realize it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, moving on from uh you know, let's say uh, students have taken and passed your information privacy skills path. Uh, what are some next steps you'd recommend, whether from an education standpoint or an experience standpoint, once you have this this privacy knowledge, where do you go next with it? Do you do you take it to a company and say, I want to be your your privacy person? Do you get experience locally? Do you need to sort of pair it with some other type of certification info or or, or what's the next step? Yeah, I think that, you know, I designed a course for cyber also, a U.S. approach project course that asked for one. I think that when I designed these courses, these courses weren't designed as preparatory courses for any of the other industry certification 
organizations. But I think that with this knowledge, you go and you acquire one of the certs. Mm -hmm. If you are a cyber security uh, professional, an information security professional, I think you take two paths. I, I think that you go the CIPT route and make use of your technical expertise, or you go to C CDPSC. Mm -hmm. And then, I, then you know, if you got more bandwidth, you get take the CIPM, the privacy management course. Um, and, and I think that, you know, I love teaching the CIPPUS, but it is a policy course. It doesn't talk about technology. Yep. You know, and so it's just going to teach you about a multitude of laws. You're going to feel like an extra on the first airplane movie. You just want to <laughs> jump outside that seat because it's a lot of laws. Yes. But the speed your progress to your question, take the CIPT mm -hmm. or get the CDPSE and then get the CIPM and then go to work. Start applying. Okay. You know, set up your job alerts. I do it on LinkedIn. I mean, LinkedIn uh, is a, you know, a well-kept secret. You know, I've never had to do business development. You know, I've got mm -hmm. like you did. You went to my profile and mm -hmm. I get called all the time about jobs and opportunities. Yes, absolutely. Now, um, it sounds like, you know, and, and I, I want to make sure that I'm hearing this correctly, but it sounds like uh, getting a job in this sphere is pretty is, is going to work out if you if you can demonstrably show the search and can demonstrably show that, you know, um, the answers to the questions of how to sort of like, you know, provide value to the company. So this is not a sort of job where they need to see prior experience. And I mean, to that end, if they do, is there a way of sort of freelancing, uh, like privacy stuff before you try to land the, you know, the big fish of a job? Well, you can always do, you can always do volunteer IPPS, yeah, local ask, knowledge yeah. net chapters. Okay. So you can, they have a lot of, uh, volunteer things that you can do. Mm -hmm. um, to add to your resume, whether you, you know, I sat on, I would say a co-chair of the Baltimore, Maryland um, knowledge net chapter. Okay. And okay. then they have certain type, they have several different types of uh, boards and things you can volunteer for. But I, but I would say this, Chris, I mean, I started this journey. I'm that person you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, I acquired the knowledge. Yep. I kept studying as I was trying to get that first job. And then have no fear. You may have to take an entry level job. And I can tell you, if you do a job search on Indeed.com, if you do one on LinkedIn, there are a lot of remote opportunities. Of course, they want you to have experience, but you've just got to land that first job. Yeah. And then get that first job as an entry level person, get that on your resume, and that starts your journey. Yes. I'm not uh, going to say it's, been, it's going to be easy because remember, no. Sure. Like I told you, you know, I left uh, a, second, a senior executive job in government yep. and was driving for Uber and, and Lyft and working oh, as yeah. a private investigator before oh, yeah. I got my first privacy job. Yep. Now, um, I, I like talking to uh, cybersecurity folks in terms of, you know, the because I, I have a sense of like what the steps are, like you're starting out, you know, it's a long way to see so but you're starting maybe you're starting in the help desk, or you're starting as a, a security analyst, and you're reading log files, and you're looking for abnormalities, and then you sort of automate yourself out of your position and up to the next level, you become a manager, and you become this and this and this. Uh, what, what does the day to day work of an entry level privacy person look like? What are your tasks compared to someone who, I mean, it sounds like the sort of top point is you're setting policy, you're setting like a, a master framework around your company and so forth. But what is, what, what is the sort of like the, you know, the grunt level uh, prof uh, privacy person do for a company well, I'm doing, organization? I, you know, I'm experienced. I'm doing grunt work now. So okay. <laughs> it never stops. Great. But tell me about you know, it. <laughs> one of the things that, you know, one of the things that, like you said, um, Updating, pro understanding external requirements, mm -hmm. um, helping the organization update their policies, procedures. Another thing that you're going to find yourself doing and, and it's in demand is privacy risk assessments. Mm, okay. And so, you know, privacy threshold analyses. And so before an organization acquires a new system, you know, or, you know, implements a new activity that's going to process personal information, you got to do that privacy impact assessment. And you'll see a lot of, you know, new privacy professionals performing those tasks, partnering with the ISOs, partnering with the business and mission uh, owners, functional 
and business owners to understand these systems, assess the privacy risk associated with them, come up with controls that mitigate those. Um, and as part of that uh, assessment authorization pack, you'd be able to present that to the uh, AO so mm-hmm. he or she can improve that system for use. Right. Um, you're going to find yourself looking at compliance, especially if you're working in industries like healthcare with HIPAA, finance, and some of the others. Again, you're going to be there doing compliance assessments, internal assessments of the organization. And this is an, a continuous process. You know, but over time, you're going to acquire those skills and understanding. And then you start looking at more senior positions. Mm -hmm. You know, again, you know, everyone's not going to be that organizational chief privacy officer. You know, it takes years to get there. And and lots of times, you know, that requires you to be an attorney of sort in many organizations. But, you know, you can find yourself, you know, you do that for a while, get the experience and then consider consulting. Mm hmm. You know, there are some great organizations out there like True Staff, Staffing, um, you know, recruited me several times because mm-hmm. they focus on privacy professionals, hmm. information security professionals. So looking at those, even if you can't walk into a door and compete, try to get one of the staffing organizations to place you. Mm-hmm. Build up your competence, build up your experience. And then over time, like I said, the jobs are there. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I mean, there, yeah. there are tons of jobs at Apple, Google. Yep. And a lot of these healthcare organizations, a lot of them are remote right now. Mm-hmm. Like I work from home. Yeah. So, you know, you know, that job path itself, you know, I, I was, I was creating a business with a, a great friend of mine, Steve Holland, and we were laying out for our business. What was our career path? Cause we were both in the military. And it started out with the with the privacy analyst. And then it translated, you know, into a privacy technologist, privacy manager. And then being able, you know, once you've done that, that was within our own organization. You know, then posturing yourself for, you know, deputy, you know, director of privacy, you know, yeah. CPO of private. A lot of people, too, if you have the bandwidth, I, you know, you might even consider going, going to law school. Right. I'm just too old. Yeah, I was going to ask that. It sounds like that would be a a really good value add or even go the other way around. If you're in just strictly a lawyer or in law right now, then it and you want to make a move toward the tech sector, it would make sense to sort of understand privacy. It seems like you would add a lot of value if you were. You would. Or even if you just want to understand privacy from the legal standpoint. Yes. Because from an attorney, you're going to find that attorney, you know, they're going to be fast tracked over time for those CPO positions. For sure. Because of the legal implications, but they still need people like me, the practitioner. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Uh, so uh, this is always the $64,000 question. It doesn't sound like you had much of a problem, but you, you know, you were, you were, you were pushing and you had a passion for it anyway, while you were, while you were driving, uh, you know, um, Uber and Lyft and so forth, but without a professor assigning weekly tasks, if you have a skills uh, account, uh, some people might have a hard time staying on track and meeting their learning objectives. Do you have any tips to help lifelong learners stay focused on training and accomplish their goals in a, in a timely fashion? You know what you do? They lay out a three to five year plan mm-hmm. and they write those those goals for years one, three and five. Mm-hmm. And then you put them on a whiteboard or race, uh, dry erase board, whatever. Mm-hmm. And you enroll in a program. And then periodically you go back to that goals list and you see if you've done that. You do an assessment where you are in life because it's not going to be easy. And you have to be hungry and you got to be able to persevere. Because the end state is to get that job or jobs that you want. And every day you waste and every second you take a break is deterring you from achieving those goals. Mm -hmm. You're going to have setbacks. You know, I've had people try to take these certs and fail three times. Yeah. I had people working in senior privacy positions, taking the certs and failing them two and three times. Yeah. Which right. is terrifying. Yeah. And so, you know, for, you know, when I mentor people, I tell them you got to start with goals. Whether you have, if you don't have a dry erase board, get you a notebook. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If it is, I'm going to complete this degree, my bachelor's or my master's in this amount of time. You know, and you set that end state, that graduation date, and you have goals on how you're going to get there. Yes. 
And then when you don't, you have to explain to yourself why I didn't get it. Yep. Yeah. yeah and yeah. you got to be, and you have to persevere. Mm-hmm. People that persevere, they get there, they take that road not taken and they stay on track. They achieve their goals. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, yeah. It depends yeah. on the, it's a great question. Depends yeah. on the individual. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I like all of those. Uh, Mike Myers, our, our last week guest also said, uh, uh, schedule your examination, you know, when you think you would realistically be ready and like, ha- cause you, you know, you can, you can, you can study abstractly for as long as you want, but you know, if you, if you say in six weeks, I have to take the A plus or whatever, like that's going to, you're, you're, you're more likely to be like, oh, I better get ready. <laughs> and it's a no brilliant, more. it's a, he was a brilliant, he was, that was a brilliant response because remember we're in an ever changing industry. Yeah. So the version of the test that you took a boot camp for might have changed last year, mm-hmm. which means the questions are going to change. And I and I try to encourage people taking my um, IPP courses. You know, for me, it took me about three, three weeks, four weeks to get ready for the exam. Yep. Don't wait six months. Yeah. Because the exam will change. And then you're reaching out to Chris Stevens trying to get updated materials. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Stay on path studying. Set aside an hour a day. Yep. You know, during football season, I'll allow you to take off Sunday, mm-hmm. <laughs> but stay on track. It goes back to those yeah. goals. And then, you know, look out two months or so. Uh, that's what I did for the C, for the CIPM. But the only reason I passed the CIP, I mean, the uh, CSUM mm-hmm. was because of your boot camp. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> if, if I hadn't taken your boot camp, I probably would have taken six months to a year to study for that exam. Wow. But I was able to take, uh, you know, your week long boot camp starting the first November, I tested on December and I did quite well on the exam. Fantastic. And I attribute that to the instructor and to your course. That's great. Great to hear. I love, I love to hear that feedback. So uh, thank you. So Chris, as we wrap up today, where do you see cybersecurity education going either in person or, or virtually in the years to come? I mean, more times being spent at home with laptops and good Wi-Fi. do you see career learning changing demonstrably in say the next decade? I do. And I, I see it at the delivery. Mm-hmm. Also, you know, how do we deliver this content in an era of pandemics? And how do we how do we make the training itself role based where individuals can truly understand how, you know, this training is going to help them do their jobs? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I you know, we've seen a lot of training providers go to online formats. Um, you're going to see that if you're talking about it from you know, a privacy perspective, you know, it's going to expand out new jurisdictions, new jurisdictional laws. You're going to need training for that. Um, I think you're going to see new certifications arise that are going to be important to individuals. Yeah. And so and for me as an instructor, you know, I foresee that I'll be well employed. Now I'm talking about I'm, I'll be in my 70s soon. So, you know. <laughs> I don't know if I'll be teaching then, but, I, you know, it's been amazing just over the last 10 years of looking how cybersecurity training has evolved and okay. privacy training, information security training, how we deliver it, the content. Um, and I think it's phenomenal. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, we're educating a generation of new professionals. that are going to help organizations show due diligence and due care from a cybersecurity perspective, information security perspective. Don't forget privacy. Don't forget privacy. All right. That's a perfect place to wrap up here. So uh, last question, what's what's next for Chris Stevens? And also, if our listeners want to know more about you and your many activities, uh, where should they go online? Well, they can go to LinkedIn. You know, I, okay. I, um, LinkedIn is where I post a, I sent out a, on Twitter, then go to Twitter. Mm-hmm. I produce a, a newsletter, cybersecurity, information security, and privacy newsletter okay. um, that goes out Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Wow. So if you're a LinkedIn uh connect you'll get that um chris stevens is old and so chris stevens this would probably be his last hurrah i like the job that i have now i put off taking a job i I like the freelance perspective but i enjoy what i do i'll probably do that and then next in my um windshield is probably social security (laughs) yeah (laughs) counting down the days counting down the days putting the x's on the calendar dates that's exactly (laughs) those goals three to i don't have a three to five i've got like a three to three and a half (laughs) phenomenal well uh you're you're an inspiration to all of us who still have a lot longer to go on our on our journey here but uh uh again chris stevens thanks so much for joining me again i knew this was going to be fun and it was a blast but it was also very enlightening so thanks for your time hey you're welcome hopefully my comments were relevant 
And oh, uh, I hope it helps someone out there. And Chris, I can't thank you enough. Um, we should thank you for the good work you do of huh. uh, getting the word out and you continue to do the great work you're doing. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. That's, that's nice to hear. So uh, I'll sign off by saying, as always, thank you to everyone listening to and supporting CyberWork uh, at their workplace. Uh, new episodes of the CyberWork podcast are available every Monday at 1 p.m. Central, both on video at our YouTube page and on audio wherever fine podcasts are downloaded. Uh, and I want to make sure that you all know that we have a lot more than weekly interviews about cybersecurity careers to offer. You can actually learn cybersecurity for free on our InfoSec Skills platform. Just go to infosecinstitute.com slash free and create your own account. You can start learning right now. We have 10 free cybersecurity foundation courses from Keytron Evans, six cybersecurity leadership courses from Cicero Chimbanda, 11 courses on digital forensics, 11 courses on incident response, seven courses on security architecture, plus courses on DevSecOps, Python for cybersecurity, JavaScript, ICS, and SCADA security fundamentals and more. Just go to infosecinstitute.com slash free and check out some learning today. Thank you once again to InfoSec instructor and InfoSec skills author, Chris Stevens. And thank you all so much for watching and listening. We will speak to you next week. Mm-hmm.